James Green was raised entirely by his mother until he was five years old. And he never knew his father. James didn't believe his mother when she made some ambiguous comment about jet testing and an accident. He always had the feeling that she wasn't telling the truth. James rarely felt depressed about living with his mother alone because it wasn't a very difficult lifestyle. But James knew from a way that he would have a new father when Edward entered their lives. Edward was a prosperous businessman who gave his family his whole attention and support. James had never seen his mother so happy. And Penelope thought she was living her best life with him around. It appeared as though their home had finally welcomed the much-needed happiness and that it would remain there indefinitely. James started referring to Edward as, Dad, which thrilled and didn't bother him. Thanks to his mother's encouragement. After all, he had a father now who would watch out for and encourage him at all times. Edward Douglas genuinely met and beyond all expectations. He let his stepson experience the thrill of trout catching every weekend by going fishing with James and taking him to see the newest Hollywood productions. Edward was the embodiment of a true guy and a devoted parent in James's eyes. Because of his youth, James was unable to determine if Edward was acting sincere or sincere in his affections. In any case, James didn't see anything but positive in Edward until he was around seven. That's when his stepfather started progressively controlling him. It was done gently at first, but repeatedly. Edward, for example, questioned James's desire to play soccer, implying that he would get hurt and advising tennis or swimming as an alternative. Edward persisted in his influence peddling after James complied, convincing him to switch from saxophone to piano tuition. Edward stated, only subways and drifters play the saxophone. Grand pianos are pianos played by real musicians. James caved in once more. James treasured Edward referring to him as, son. Edward never seemed to make errors and always seemed to do the right thing in the eyes of the boy. However, James, now eight years old, found himself spending a lot of time alone himself with his stepfather when Penelope unexpectedly became very ill. This was the period when Edward's actual personality started to emerge. James stayed at home and was unable to visit his mother when Penelope was in the hospital. Edward's emphasis on preventing James from seeing his mother in her poor state may have had a purpose. When will mom return? Tears filled James's eyes as he asked. At first, Edward made an effort to cheer James up with words of optimism. But when he grew weary from the hospital and the strain of Penelope's care, he stopped consoling the kid and started bracing him for the worst. James was too young and innocent to completely understand the severity of the word, cancer, when he first heard it. Edward returned home one dreadful night in a terrible temper and promptly hid in his study. James overheard bits and pieces of a phone call that mentioned Penelope Green's death two hours earlier as he walked by the door. A new level of terror welled up inside James as the terrible truth hit him. That his mom would get better and life would go back to normal was a hope he had always held on to. On the other hand, being by himself with his stepfather made him fearful of what the future held. After pressing his ear to the door, James overheard Edward use the ominous words, orphanage, and custody. James wasn't familiar with the term, custody, but the word, orphanage, conjured images of dirty. Abandoned kids who had lost their parents. James was unable to face the scary ideas about his future because he was so overcome with fear and worry. Tears flowing down James's face. He retreated from the door and muttered, No, no, I don't want to go to an orphanage. A dark cloud rolled over him just then. Cut it out, James, you will remain at my side. I will ensure custody regardless of the consequences. Standing before him, James saw his stepfather's stare which was both serious and unwavering. After putting James to bed, Edward carried him to his room. He subsequently assumed charge of planning Penelope's funeral. Edward was alone responsible for making the arrangements because Penelope had grown up in an institution and did not have any close relatives. The tragic occurrences that sparked James's deepest, darkest emotions were ones he would never forget. Edward did the right thing by keeping his word and getting custody of his stepson. After that, James's life took a sharp turn for the worst. It became clear that Edward was a very authoritarian father. 
James had to do well in school and agree to all of Edward's rules if he wanted his dad to approve of him. His stepfather would have a severe talk with him whenever he did badly in school as a moral punishment. Although James was never physically abused by Edward, he had limited freedom as a child due to the strict supervision his father had implemented. James benefited from this rigidity in that it helped him become more self-reliant and focused on the big picture. Edward groomed James to succeed him as business owner since he did not have any biological offspring. After some time had passed, James finally made it through high school and was accepted into college to major in economics. In his pursuit of perfection to satisfy his strict stepfather, he believed he could not afford to make any mistakes. Edward was cautious about showering James with compliments because he was afraid he would lose control if he did. But Edward got James a really pricey present after he graduated from college. Let me give you this. You have officially acquired this vehicle. Edward relinquished the keys to his cherished vehicle, explaining that he would purchase a replacement. However, he insisted that the old one not be discarded at the junkyard. With a gentle grin, James accepted what was likely his stepfather's first gift to him in their many years of friendship. James didn't care that the car had been driven for a long time. His stepfather's approval and attention were the most important things to him and were highly prized. James started to imitate Edward in every way, including voice, etiquette, and fashion choices, using his stepfather's vehicle, observe yourself, developing a double, Edward's friends quipped, at this rate, he'll be taking over your chair soon. Edward dismissed the comments, even if they made him laugh, when he was not yet ready for retirement and had only recently turned 48. There were rumors that Edward periodically dated other women after Penelope passed away. But James never brought up the subject since he thought it was embarrassing and unimportant. James soon fell in love with Monica, a young woman who soon eclipsed everything else in his life. Monica was strolling along the street in the rain when James happened to drive by. And that was how they ended up meeting. Her light coat turned black when his automobile wheel slammed into a pothole, dousing her in filthy water from head to toe and causing her to cry. James leapt out of the car realized what he had done, and started to apologize to the stranger. To his credit, he tried to make things right right away by offering to purchase Monica a new coat. No, this coat is very great, still furious but becoming somewhat less so. She answered, I'm not ready to trade it in for a new one. All right, then let me at least cover the cost of dry cleaning, James persisted. Monica nodded and said, All right, if you insist you can pay for my dry cleaning. After a little hesitation, they were conversing about everything under the sun in a little cafe not even five minutes later. Although Monica's coat was already at the dry cleaners, she completely forgot about it after their time together. She found herself drawn to the young man for no apparent reason. Even though she was enjoying their talk so much, Monica had broken up painfully with the older man who had first won her over a month earlier. After only six months of dating, she broke up with him, but James was obviously different. His gaze betrayed his fascination with the young lady, whom he considered to be the pinnacle of feminine beauty. Following that amazing night, James and Monica were romantically involved. The young businessman first concealed his fiance from his stepfather out of concern for his disapproval. But James knew he had to tell his stepfather right away when Monica revealed she was expecting a child a month later. With obvious reluctance, Edward welcomed the news of his stepson's upcoming marriage. You should not settle down with all those onesies and diapers just yet. Anyhow, who is she? Probably a waitress. James nervously answered, No, Dad, sorry to bring up the subject. She's from an ordinary family and works as a manager. Edward was not pleased with his stepson's reply and aggressively counseled him against getting married too soon. Unfortunately, their discussion turned into a brawl, which left James feeling very negative feelings against his stepfather. The young businessman went forward with his plans in spite of this. Edward regrettably missed the wedding and never had a face-to-face -face encounter with Monica. James and Edward were so estranged from each other for several months that their communication almost came to an end. James and Monica's life were brimming with happiness as time went on. Thanks to their unborn child, 
James was completely preoccupied with his pregnant wife's expanding tummy. It appeared as though she could give birth at any moment, even though her due date was still more than a month away. At this rate, you'll give birth sooner than expected, James stated with a troubled tone. He had a good feeling. Born in the eighth month of his mother's pregnancy, little Billy was, by most accounts, born too soon. Nonetheless, the obstetricians thought Monica had given them an inaccurate due date. James was so moved by the situation that he didn't see the difference, prior to James's stepfather paying him a visit. Everything was running well. Edward brought toys and flowers to the party. Edward was taken aback to the point of dropping the presents when he laid eyes on his stepson's wife. James didn't understand what had transpired, but his father swiftly retreated. What's going on? Monica simply shrugged, showing that she was just as perplexed as James when he inquired. Edward adamantly refrained from talking about the matter and refused to provide any clarification. A year went by while James fretted and doubted. The issue was that he looked nothing like his son Billy. Monica had pale hair. James had light hair the color of ripe wheat. And the child had scant, coal black hair. As a result, James began to suspect something troubling. He made things worse by continuing to try to find answers when none of his efforts were successful. James, intent on finding out what had happened, arranged for a forensic medical examination so that a DNA test could be performed. It was no surprise that Monica was opposed to the test. Yet, James persisted in pursuing the case in court, forcing his wife to justify her stance to the judge. Edward tried to discourage James from moving forward by making an appearance in court. The court said to Monica, Ma'am, why are you refusing the DNA test? As she sobbed. Have you had a particular rationale in mind? Your Honor, I do have a specific reason, Monica said after gathering herself from her sobbing. Here we are, in this courtroom, with my son's biological father. Edward Douglas is his name. What, what, may I ask what you said? James couldn't hold back his astonishment and let out a cry. Edward sprinted out of the courtroom for fresh air, causing gasps from the spectators. The fact that Monica was pregnant when she met James was later made public knowledge. Unbeknownst to Edward, she was carrying his child when they split up a month before she met James. Monica had not meant to mislead anyone. She had just failed to recognize her error until after it had happened. She prayed for forgiveness daily out of fear of exposing the truth. James, who had finally grasped his wife's true intentions, finally forgave her for telling the deception she had to in order to keep their family safe. He could sense Monica's profound affection for her spouse. James, accompanied by his son, departed the courtroom while his wife was embraced. To the sound of enthusiastic applause, the young family never fought again after that. James became the only heir to Edward's estate and business when the unfortunate Edward passed away in a vehicle accident one month following the court hearing. It might have been destiny. After watching the first story above, do you have any thoughts? Feel free to share your opinions in the comments section. Now, let's watch another similar story. Michael Johnson was accustomed for a long time to the notion that his father's name was connected to big chances and fortune. Michael tried not to think about it and concentrated on accumulating as much experience as he could, even though his father was unable to claim such accomplishments himself. Michael knew full well the price his father had paid for his success. He had seen too many obstacles fall from the sky, such as fights with rivals attempting to steal customers and problems with tax officials who would sooner settle disagreements in court. Donovan Johnson could never truly unwind and enjoy life until he turned 50, but this did not mean that his critics stopped trying to discredit him or that life became easy. Donovan could now depend on his son's support. Michael was an adult with the knowledge to potentially succeed him, having graduated from Boston's Harvard Business School, knowing that his son was capable of running a profitable company. Donovan had long dreamed of retiring and engaging in less stressful pursuits. There were disparities between Michael and his father, even though they were related, especially in the way they approached business. Michael's goal was to create a new route apart from his father's money. Not just take over the family firm, the young businessman was also quite active in charitable activity, helping institutions for the vulnerable and orphanages, 
Donovan recognized and respected his son's dedication to altruistic pursuits. Donovan was surprised when Michael said he was planning to leave Chicago and explore the small villages of Massachusetts because he thought it was so important. What makes you want to do that? We should concentrate on growing what we already have since we already have enough business in our empire, Donovan inquired, with a curious smile in return, Michael said, Dad, I want to diversify our investment portfolio and offer new perspectives to our firm, small towns offer lots of options, for instance, we may invest in a cafe or restaurant or purchase a factory and begin producing clothing. Donovan took his son's words to heart and saw their merit. He realized that businesses could not be stagnant and needed to constantly evolve. Well, if this concept excites you so much, then go ahead and pursue it, like you. I began out tiny and needed some time to settle in, just keep me informed, Donovan grinned. Michael knew his dad would go along with his plan. He had already planned a tour of regional towns that had social institutions and enterprises that were faltering or insolvent. He made the decision to begin with a week-long stay, intending to rent an apartment while there. He could have made reservations at a hotel, but he'd rather stay out of the spotlight. At dawn, Michael left Chicago in his brand new Ford, loaded up with clothes. In order to make sure he had enough time for all of his goals, he enjoyed starting his workday early. It was easier than he had thought to find a rental apartment, and he used a newspaper to help him look. After locating the adverts for rental properties, Michael highlighted the ones he liked. He was dismayed to see the house at the first address was in a horrible state. His second try, though, was a success. The residence belonged to an old woman, maybe 80 years old, although she looked very healthy and had a strong mind for her age, because her home was too big for her to live in alone, Alvarez was renting out half of it. Michael knew he didn't have to look any farther when he stepped into the living room. The lovely smells of cinnamon, vanilla, and something more permeated the house and made him hungry right away, Mrs. Alvarez said. I've made roast chicken with pineapples, baked potatoes, and lemon sauce, and the perfume almost took Michael by surprise. It smells amazing. It tastes just as fantastic, I'm sure. Is this your ploy to draw on renters? Preparing a mouth-watering meal. Michael smiled as he asked, grinning, Mrs. Alvarez ushered Michael into the kitchen, as it happened, she had worked as a cook when she was younger and was very knowledgeable in the kitchen, she reflected, oh, if only you could have seen it, it was a fantastic restaurant with amazing food, dancing till you dropped, and live music, it's hardly made like that anymore, most cooks can hardly turn out a good burger, she continued. Michael seemed to perk up considerably when the restaurant was mentioned. Without hesitation, he resolved to discover its owner. Despite her obvious exhaustion from spending so much time alone, Mrs. Alvarez persisted in speaking. The old woman's eyes genuinely lit up with delight when Michael timidly asked about Mrs. Alvarez's family. Oh, you must see my granddaughter, Louise, she responded in response. She's stunningly gorgeous and a master chef, compared to her. I am completely inadequate, as he stared at her with interest, Michael retrieved the cash from his wallet and paid the elderly woman three months' rent, it was too much, she remarked, there's enough money here to cover rent for a year, no worries, Michael responded, take it easy, if you continue to feed me at this rate, I may not be able to squeeze through the door when I decide to remain for a while, Michael let out a laugh. The laid-back atmosphere of Mrs. Alvarez's residence transported him to a bygone era, where he might have spent quality time with his grandmother. Throughout the day, Michael scoured the area around town in search of shuttered businesses that would require substantial funding to reopen. Not only did he find the restaurant, but he also uncovered other promising auto repair companies, a partially deserted laundry, and one furniture manufacturer, but what really got to him was the orphanage which was obviously in terrible shape and needed repairs badly, the burned roof tiles, peeling paint, drab walls, and missing glass gave the place a sad, abandoned vibe, I really ought to pay this orphanage a visit, Michael pondered, the place obviously needs a makeover, a better life for the kids would be a result, I'm sure, Michael, after surveying the city's facilities, zeroed in on the eatery, 
it has the potential to become a lucrative business with the correct strategy and effort. Recognizing Michael's dedication, Alvarez would consistently whip up a hearty breakfast to fuel him for the day. Michael returned home earlier than normal and discovered Louise, the grandmother's granddaughter, in the kitchen. Mrs. Alvarez was ecstatic to see Michael while she was making tea. My apologies, am I cutting someone off? With a hint of embarrassment, Michael inquired. But Mrs. Alvarez was adamant that he take a seat at the head of the table. Here, have a bite, my dear. She said when she presented him with a substantial slice of pie. Don't worry about Louise, she has a short fuse but avoids arguments over insignificant matters. Michael and Louise looked at each other knowingly before laughing uncontrollably. Michael nearly choked on his pie because he was laughing so hard. Okay, okay, relax, Mrs. Alvarez murmured in an imitative tone. She turned to Louise and continued, find something better to do than laugh at me. A wave of compassion for the beautiful and gifted girl washed over Michael. Almost any traditional American or European food could be prepared by Louise Alvarez, who proved to be an excellent chef. She was stuck making burgers and hot dogs at a roadside joint that motorcyclists and truckers frequented because there weren't any good jobs for her. Michael was aware of how challenging it could be to obtain better employment in a small town. In the kitchen, he and Louise conversed until nightfall, at which point Michael offered to take her home. Glancing at the young couple, Alvarez told them not to go out too late since she wouldn't be able to sleep until she was sure everyone had returned home. After their romantic stroll under the stars, Michael and Louise were filled with hope that their friendship may grow into something more. They were obviously drawn to one another even though they didn't jump right into anything. Michael made it a point to schedule his days so he could be home when Louise went to see her grandmother after that, Mrs. Alvarez said. They would make a great couple, as she said goodbye to them. The elderly woman's statements were undoubtedly somewhat true. She was an experienced woman who knew what she was talking about after all. The night they started dating was something Michael and Louise would never forget. The young lover's wildly racing hearts appeared to be reflected in the raindrops pattering on the roof of a little motel, though Louise and Michael had long suspected they could not stay friends. Everything happened very suddenly. It's difficult to predict how their relationship would have developed if Michael hadn't gotten an unexpected call one day from his father alerting him to his condition. The physicians may not be correct, but it doesn't seem serious. I have a fever. And my breathing is labored. Michael became really concerned when his father told him, the partners from Cleveland are coming. As soon as possible, Michael left for Chicago, telling Louise he would only be gone for a few days. Don't worry, I'll be back in no time, he comforted her, saying, I just need to help my dad and go to a few meetings. But as it turned out, reality was rather different. It turned out that Donovan had more serious health problems than first believed, necessitating a month or so of hospital stays. Michael had to assume control of the company in the meantime as a result. Michael could have asked Louise to move to Chicago with him but he was too soon engrossed in his new duties overseeing the company as well as his father's care. Consequently, memories of the woman from the tiny village progressively vanished from consciousness. Michael even thought about giving up on everything at first and going back to live with Mrs. Alvarez and her granddaughter, but he quickly came to terms with his new situation and moved on. It was in this time frame that Michael got to know Diana. She focused on the talented young man right away. Their chance encounter at first, which seemed to be limited to a business connection, turned into something more than imagined. Diana showed Michael a lot of love and care, and she was lucky to be in the right location at the right moment to win his heart. To be honest, Michael didn't even really get how or when Diana started sleeping in his bed. It was more like a fleeting moment of lunacy and most definitely wasn't love at first sight. This frequently occurs when a couple starts dating and engages in physical contact before truly getting to know one another. Michael, of course, never forgot about Louise. He thought about her occasionally and was very sorry about the way their relationship ended. Michael had to deny Diana that they were a couple in order to be able to go back to Louise without betraying her. Donovan Johnson eventually got better and was able to take over as manager of the company. 
but by then Michael was already deeply in love with Diana, who was pressuring him to be married. Six months after their first meeting, the young businessman proposed to her since he couldn't help but be captivated by her charisma. Michael was just tired of Diana's constant urging, even though it was more of a forced choice than an ardent wish, at any costs, the woman was going to marry him. After five years, Michael's life had undergone significant changes, most importantly, he had replaced Donovan Johnson as the head of the family business, relocating to Miami, Donovan led a reclusive life as a millionaire often telling his son that he hoped to live long enough to see his grandkids and that he preferred it to happen soon, though Michael wasn't against the idea. Diana didn't appear eager to take on the role of fatherhood. My dear, there is yet time. Permit me to indulge a bit longer, I'm just 25 years old, diapers and midnight feedings aren't for me, the woman remarked, whenever possible, Michael tried to stay out of arguments, although he avoided doing so at home. Diana had long since let him down, she was little more than a stunningly gorgeous woman with long legs. She spent her days at restaurants and beauty salons after she finally attained her fantasy of a lavish lifestyle. And she would often switch up her cars to complement her extensive collection of colorful handbags. Unfamiliar voices emerged from the bedroom one day as Michael returned home from work earlier than normal as Michael was startled to find an unfamiliar man in his bed, he listened in, on the verge of passing out from shock, the man was leisurely describing his post-millionaire ambitions. Bringing up the fact that he had recently acquired the contact information for a Milwaukee psychic known for her potions, the man claimed that the potion might covertly induce a heart attack and cause the victim's death within 48 hours, Diana said, just deal with it already completely unaware that Michael was around her, for the past 12 months, all I've heard from you is empty promises, instead of platitudes about love and happiness, I want concrete steps. In that instant, Michael understood the depth of the treachery, after hurling Diana and her half-naked lover out onto the street, he stormed into the bedroom like an enraged angel, the idea of suing me is very unacceptable, Michael cautioned, this divorce will not yield you a single penny. If you have an affair, I will employ top-tier attorneys who will have no problem establishing it. All those cameras around the house. You must have forgotten about them, thankfully. They've made it to every area except the bedroom. For whatever reason, I finally got around to watching the footage again. In his grief, Michael hid out in his study till the break of day. He decided to do some charitable activity which always made him feel good, in order to improve his spirits, he felt a mystical influence whenever he helped other people, it just so happened that Michael picked an orphanage in Luis Alvarez's hometown, he planned a visit with the orphanage's administration because he wanted to help the small orphans, not because he ever imagined seeing Luis again. Michael anticipated that the kids would be as happy as Christmas morning when they saw him, he was right, the students had planned a talent show and a fun schedule of contests and activities, following the distribution of gifts, Michael suggested repairing the structure and constructing a brand new playground to substitute the outdated and rundown one, he saw a little child, maybe five years old, standing by the door of the orphanage with a chocolate bar in his hands, at that moment, he was ready to depart, Michael couldn't help but recognize the boy's face, Michael was almost speechless with shock when he drew near, my god, I look just like this little boy when I was that age, he reflected, even the mold that the other kids teased me about, above his upper lip, is on his upper lip, too, he shares my nose shape and eye color, the orphanage workers in the area felt out of place because Michael's surprise was real, from where does this little lad originate? Had someone left him, may I know his name, Michael spoke with the filmmaker, my son's name is Sam, Michael, a woman said, approaching from behind Michael, before the director could respond, I truly believed he would never lay eyes on you again. Michael knew exactly who he was about to see when he turned around in a cold sweat, with a broad grin on her face, Luis Alvarez greeted him in an orphanage outfit and a chef's hat, thus, is he your son? When Michael heard his own voice, he was taken aback and questioned, Yes, Michael, he's your son as well, Louise said while nodding, 
My pregnancy wasn't discovered until a month after you departed, and you vanished without a trace throughout that time, thanks to my grandma's assistance. I was able to raise Sam, and now I help out around the house by making meals for the kids. With Sam's support, I can do it. Michael felt lightheaded and his face went pale. His hand went automatically to Forest High. He asked, But why didn't you tell me sooner? I could have assisted you. You could have relocated to Chicago, you know. After all, I'm a wealthy man. Michael started to say something, then cut himself short. He understood that Luis had nothing to do with what had occurred. He knew that things would have been different if he hadn't departed for Chicago at the time, however. Sam required a father figure he had never encountered, taking the boy in his arms. Michael met his gorgeous blue eyes and began to cry quietly. He had so much time lost, and now he had the opportunity to put things right, with a gentle touch on Michael's shoulder and a soft welcome home. Dear, Louise stepped forward and planted a kiss on his cheek. The orphanage staff was brought to tears by the sight of this lovely family. Michael grabbed Sam's and Louise's hands and made his way out. Now that his vehicle was parked in front of the structure, he intended to take them to Disneyland, the happiest spot on the planet. After watching the stories above, do you have any thoughts? Feel free to share your opinions in the comments section. If you enjoyed our video, please like, subscribe, and share our channel. That all about today's stories. See you next time.